It's so wonderful to be with you all here in Davos. And welcome to the audience that's joining from the live stream as well. This Beta Zone session is Cybersecurity Futures 2030. My name is Anne Cleveland. I'm the executive director of the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And I'm going to start with a presentation. And then it's my honor to invite Ken Jia to join me on the stage. Ken is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Fortinet. And we'll have a dialogue with all of you about the future of cybersecurity and what it means for today. So let's get started. Imagine if I were to tell you that I have a time machine. And we are going to travel forward six years into the future, to the start of 2030. What would we see when we get there? Would we see people hanging out in the metaverse, wearing virtual reality goggles? Will we be getting supplies delivered by drone and paid for by cryptocurrency? What will the cybersecurity landscape look like in 2030? How will organizations defend themselves when AI can launch millions of new attack every second? Or what will have happened to public trust when deep fakes are so authentic and so ubiquitous that they're impossible to distinguish from the real thing? Now, imagine that we get back in our time machine and we travel back to the present day. What would we start to do differently based on what we had seen in the future? This question is at the heart of what we do at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity at the University of California, Berkeley. For the past year, we've been working with the World Economic Forum's Center for Cybersecurity to imagine the future of digital security and what that means for today. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a real-time machine, but we do have a proven approach for developing foresight and for anticipating tomorrow's cybersecurity challenges and opportunities. When people imagine the future, we have a hard time imagining anything except a simple extrapolation of the present or complete disaster. So we use scenarios, plausible narratives of how, about how the future could evolve. Scenarios are a useful tool for strategic planning because they look at the interplay of different variables that will drive how the future could be shaped. And of course, we focus on cybersecurity, but scenarios recognize that technology doesn't exist in a vacuum. So we also look at driving forces like climate change, the political and economic environment, military conflict, or cultural change, things that will create the headwinds and tailwinds that will shape the landscape for the future of cybersecurity. Now, let's climb back into that time machine and take a look at some scenarios for what 2030 might look like. Now, a quick caveat um, that the video that I'm about to show you was developed with AI tools off the shelf that weren't available even a couple of years ago. Uh, we did that as a way to experiment with the future in our presentation. Uh, some of the characters in it will look a little bit fake. We think that's a feature, not a bug, but we'll let all of you be the judges. So here we go. Authorities are investigating a break-in at a new semiconductor factory in Dresden, Germany. The intrusion follows a series of major cyber attacks on chip makers. Some experts are attributing the attacks to nation states amid tightening export controls on semiconductors. Still others speculate the attackers may be looking to steal trade secrets to sell on the burgeoning black market. Whoever is to blame, the attack shows the vulnerability of global supply chains, and there are concerns that rising chip prices will fuel inflation again. In political news, elections around the world have been thrown into question after the discovery that software in widely used voting machines may have been compromised. While there is no proof that chips corrupted vote counts, online disinformation campaigns have fueled confusion and threats of violence in several countries. The multilateral trustworthy election treaty of 2028 was supposed to ensure that our voting machines were secure. These election results simply cannot stand. 
Global stocks hit a record high again this week as major artificial intelligence companies announced record profits. Other winners on Wall Street included automakers, whose stocks surged with the announcement of new robot land factories that can produce up to 2,500 customized vehicles per day. Global leaders will meet this week to discuss the applications of new custom gene therapies that can prolong human lifespans by decades. Some are concerned that the DNA data behind the therapies could be vulnerable to misuse. While some countries have tried to set up safeguards to protect their citizens' DNA data, the companies developing the therapies have shifted their operations to other regions. We'll be right back. So, of course, those scenarios show only a small sliver of the kinds of things that could happen between now and 2030. And some of the headlines might seem a bit doom and gloom. But if we get back in that time machine and travel back to the present day, the question for decision makers is, what could we be doing now to prevent the harms and amplify the upsides of the kinds of things that are depicted here? For example, how could governments and companies work together to secure supply chains for products like semiconductors, machine learning products, batteries, and other technologies that will be vital to the flourishing of our societies in the future? How can we turn a headline like this into this? What could we be doing to lead the way to improved AI safety and security? What new institutions will be needed? How can we help nations that are in earlier stages of digitalization? How can we turn a headline like this into a headline like this? These questions are at the heart of Cybersecurity Futures 2030. Any number of geopolitical events, technology breakthroughs, or other shocks can and will happen between now and 2030. And when they do, they'll feel like a surprise unless we're prepared with insights that are robust across scenarios. From workshops around the world, we've developed three insights that we think should be on the agenda of CEOs and government leaders as you prepare for the cybersecurity landscape of 2030. These insights are the three T's, trust, tempo, and talent. Let's start with trust. A key finding is that the future security landscape of 2030 will depend on the ability of societies to match the speed of trust with the speed of innovation. Now, what do I mean by that? We've already seen how the spread of false information online, whether intentional or not, can undermine the fabric of our society. The online spread of myths and disinformation is now a core cybersecurity concern. Cybersecurity will be less about protecting the confidentiality of information and more about protecting its integrity and its provenance. There are major upsides for those who get the trust equation right. Governments and companies that are able to follow through on long-term cybersecurity strategies will have advantages in attracting talent and business in seizing leadership opportunities in multilateral standard setting processes and in developing the capacities to thwart disinformation campaigns. The second insight concerns tempo. This is the pace and scale of digitalization or the rate at which people go online and use digital products and services. As of today, there are approximately 5.3 billion people online. And that number is set to surge in the next five years. But we don't know how fast it will go or how it will play out differently in different regions. The pace and scale of digitalization will be as important to the landscape for security in 2030 as any capabilities of new technologies. Why? Because with that many more people and devices online, the attack surface grows exponentially. There are more devices online. There are that many more people online exposed to social engineering and other kinds of attacks. What can we do about this? We believe there is a window of opportunity in the next decade for governments to implement secure by design standards and principles 
the kinds of built-in protections that are often lacking in digital products and services today. The third and last insight is about talent. People often think of cybersecurity as a niche technical subject, but cybersecurity is really about the intersections of humans and technology. We are, at the end of the day, we are going to need humans with all different kinds of expertise to lead the way to a secure future. This will not happen on its own. The global battle for cybersecurity talent is intensifying. We need transformative investment in cybersecurity talent and training to keep this from becoming a zero-sum game. There are plenty of approaches for this. In one example, universities and colleges around the world are launching cybersecurity clinics. Students get hands-on experience defending real-world organizations in their communities from cyber attack. These are the kinds of innovative approaches that we will need if we're going to turn a headline like this into a headline like this. And training the next generation of cybersecurity talent is not as far as we need to go. We also need broad-based public education campaigns around cyber hygiene and digital literacy if we're going to thwart misinformation campaigns and garden variety cybercrime. There are major upsides for those that get this right. The internet of the future can be populated by users who are security and privacy savvy and inoculated against misinformation campaigns. So as you can see, with so many dynamic variables, it's not the best approach to prepare for the future, but for multiple possible futures. The next few years will be all about navigating a world in flux and expecting the unexpected. And if there's one thing we know about the future, it's that humor, resilience, and optimism will be critical. The good news is there are people all over the world rolling up their sleeves to tackle the digital security challenges of tomorrow in exactly this spirit. Please join us to create a cybersecurity future that amplifies the upside for all. Thank you. And now it is my honor to invite Ken Shia to the stage uh, for a dialogue about his views on the future of cybersecurity and what we can do about that today. Thank you, and, and uh, thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. Um, so Ken, you are the founder, chairman, and CEO of Fortinet. Uh, and Fortinet counts about 70% of the Fortune 100 as its customers. Um, so you know a thing or two about trust, and you know a thing or two about innovation. Um, we've talked about the three T's in this conversation so far. Um, how do you view the future of trust and matching our ability to trust digital um, online products with the speed of innovation in the marketplace? Uh, yeah, Fortinet, we uh, started uh, 24 years ago uh, in 2000. Uh, actually, it's my third company in the network security space. So that's where in the last 32 years, uh, I'm more focused on the network security. Uh, I feel it's uh, the issue we deal with today, the trust, a lot of it come from when we initially designed the internet about 50 years ago. Uh, internet original design to connect a few university government together, it's all in the same trust level. So from the very beginning, the internet protocol designed to handle the same trust level, just connect everything together and keep increase the speed. That's what we keep in using for the last 50 years. So nowadays, the internet is more, more different than 50 years ago. Much more people and even a lot of devices connect globally with millions of applications of different content. So that's where I have a, but the today's internet protocol, when we designed 50 years ago, just cannot handle different trust levels. So that's where the network security come in. 
Uh, so we have to deal with different content, uh, different application, different user, even different device from different location, different country. So that's where uh, I, I will use in the convergence to match your trust to solve the by 2030. Also, Garner also predict by 2030, the network security business will be larger than networking business because uh, network security can handle much deeper level. The content application can do different trust level compared to the today internet, which all bring everything together in the same trust level. That can solve a lot of trust issue there by network security. Thank you. And I love the three C's to go along with the three T's. Um, so maybe we should think about the next of the T's and the C's. Um, the next T uh, is the concept of tempo, or the pace and scale of digitalization. And I think that relates quite a bit to what you were just saying about different levels of trust. Um, what is your C to go along with tempo, and how do we manage the risk as the attack surface grows globally between now and the year 2030? You can see the, the speed you connect many people online, uh, especially in the next five to seven years, probably more device will connect online than people, maybe 10 times more device with the 5G, 6G technology. Uh, all this kind of uh, create a lot of a separate security risk attack surface. And, uh, and in the separate security, it's pretty interesting industry. Uh, it's a so fragmented, and also there's a southern company but no company has more than 10% market share. And every year, uh, there's a lot of new technology, a lot of new things come up. We all have to learn. Uh, so that's where to match all this uh, tempo, people get connected. And uh, we, we do feel uh, in the cybersecurity industry itself, uh, the consolidation probably will be the solution uh, to match the tempo of uh, people connect, device connect online. Uh, because uh, you need to consolidate uh, from the function level, from the device level, even from the company level, to be more efficient, handle a lot of cybersecurity risks. And the consolidation also is the basic uh, to go to the next stage to the automation. Uh, that's can quick response to all these uh, risks uh, by new connection and, uh, and respond to all these um, millions of applications connect online every year. Uh, so we see the consolidation can match the tempo. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the three C I come up in the last couple of days. <laughs> when I see your three T. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, and maybe say just a little bit more about consolidation because I think you know someone taking the devil's advocate view would say, well, the more consolidation we see in cybersecurity, the more systemic risk we create because we have a more homogenous ecosystem. I think uh, the consolidation will help in solving the efficient issue, also lower the cost. Uh, because if you look at today, uh, even yesterday breakfast, we talk about cybersecurity and equality there. So that, that's where uh, some bigger company, they have a lot of cybersecurity budget. But if you look at SMB, uh, only single digit, like less than 10% SMB have any cybersecurity protection. Uh, if you go to the consumer level, probably even lower, so that's where we see uh, the consolidation will be uh, bring some efficiency, can also lower the cost. Uh, because cybersecurity industry in the last, 20, uh, last 30, 40 years has been this kind of a fragment status for a long, long time. And uh, now with, uh, uh, in the last like, uh, 10 to 20 years, you do see some consolidation going on. Uh, especially we feel in the, in the network protection, network security side, uh, people don't want to have a multiple device to be in line, right, to, to, to do all these kind of security networking things. So that's where consolidation can help in uh, make it a cyber security or network security more broadly deployed and uh, solve it, uh, be more efficient and lower the cost, how more people can be afford for, for doing the cyber security. That's really interesting, and I want to... Um double down on one of the points you make as we start to think about the talent equation for cybersecurity. You, know, you mentioned that small and medium-sized enterprises are struggling with cybersecurity, and we know that other small organizations like 
nonprofits or small cities and municipalities or other small critical infrastructure providers are struggling to have the same cybersecurity services as large enterprise can afford. Um, and part of that equation is getting the talent out there that knows how to work with those kinds of organizations. What, what do you think, what's your third C? And uh, what do you think we need to do to transform the talent equation for cybersecurity? Uh, I feel we need a, a community uh, to handle the cybersecurity training. Uh, that's where we started with the uh, Center for Cybersecurity, I think it's about six years ago, uh, Fortinet <coughs> leading the initiative uh, to do the global cybersecurity training. So in the last five, six years, we trained about two million people, uh, over one million people certified uh, for different level of a security uh, expert. Uh, so that's where you need a different vendor working together. You also need a partner. You also need a, all the education. So we partner with about 600 universities globally, uh, all for all this cybersecurity training for free because it's really a community effort uh, from the education, from all this uh, uh, academia, from all this uh, non-profit, and then the business side and the government side all have to work in together. So bring people, because cybersecurity, a lot of new knowledge come up every year. So you need to quickly refresh the knowledge base, and at the same time, need to be more broadly people being trained uh, on the cybersecurity, how important it is. Because uh, eventually, uh, the digital power or the digital world, uh, they kind of depend on some of the cybersecurity uh, to enable a lot of new benefit, new application there. So you do need uh, more people understand the risk and also understand how to handle all this uh, like a different kind of a uh, separate security issue. Uh, so that's where take the whole community working together uh, to bring all this training up to speed. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that idea of a community approach and Fortinet has certainly been a leader there. Um, and, I, and I know that you can't do it alone. So uh, if you could wave a magic wand what, what kinds of other things would you suggest for making that transformative investment so that the whole community is participating in generating cybersecurity talent? Uh, I think the, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, is a, is a perfect platform uh, to make sure the whole community uh, really can uh, like see how important it is uh, to really uh, like raise the awareness of uh, the importance of cybersecurity. Uh, because that's the platform you can bring all the business leader, the government leader, the academic leader, all the non-profit all together. So that's where the whole community behind to handle all this issue. Uh, because from business angle, sometimes it's very difficult for us to address because uh, there's a quite a different uh, kind of uh, community uh, really need to be uh, working together uh, to handle this issue. So that's why we feel this is uh, a quite important platform uh, so that's where also the center of cybersecurity, there's a few other initiatives. So we, we lead in the training, training education side, which we feel is a quite important and also uh, uh, will be uh, in the future, we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, training need to be done uh, to a lot of people and uh, make sure we have a safe digital world. Yeah. Um, well, you've all heard the call to action to be a part of this community that is investing in uh, better cybersecurity for all. Um, and I know we have uh, just a few minutes left, and so I'd love to invite the audience to ask questions that you have for this dialogue. Wonderful question. Um, do you want to take a stab? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I think the, that's where in the next five to seven years, not only there's a 1.3 billion people connect online, but also maybe 10 times more device will be connect online. Uh, that's also bring a lot of a risk. Uh, and uh, that's where I feel uh, the convergence, when you start in building infrastructure, uh, can handle different trust level, can also kind of deal with uh, uh, different application, uh, different kind of uh, uh, content side, and also a uh, different uh, device user behind. Because right now, today's networking device cannot go that deep level. Uh, so that's create a lot of issue. Uh, just like you, you, you kind of open the door, you invite people to your home. Uh, if you know what's the background, if you know what they may do in the in the house, whatever, that's what feel much safer and uh, kind of. Uh, so right now, today, cybersecurity is facing the same issue. So we can only handle the same trust level connection there. Once you connect, you pretty much can do anything behind, and nobody know. That's where the convergence will be helping. Uh, building the infrastructure can deal much deeper level in the account application layer and also can deal with different user, uh, different device, different location, even different country. So that's where how network security keep in building up. Eventually by 2030 will be bigger business in network security than the, the current networking business. Great, let's take another couple of questions. Hey Ken, thanks for your leadership. So it's January 17, 2030, hopefully we're here in Davos six years later. Um, we talked a lot about small businesses today not having the funding, the resources to protect themselves. In your ideal state, how would you describe a future six years later for small businesses and what tools do you think will be available that might not be available today? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, if you look at today's uh, cybersecurity uh, I always, uh, I keep in saying for like 20, 30 years, it's a little bit more like 100 years ago in the healthcare, in the drug industry. Uh, so in the cybersecurity, there's so many different companies that keep in promoting their product service the best. But there's a, most of the customer have a difficult time to evaluate, to test which product, which service better. It's a, you can go, go to the healthcare industry. Uh, there's a doctor trained, certified. There's a hospital has certain certification. The same thing for finance service. Uh, the same thing for uh, like even the legal law, lawyer, all this environment. But in cybersecurity, uh, I think we pretty much reached the stage. You do need to uh, make sure there's some third party, uh, not from the business side, and also uh, uh, make sure they can help in the customer to test, evaluate, especially for SMB. Some bigger company, they have a technical resource to do that. That's where even for us, we are, I, I myself is remote engineer, so I'm more willing to sell into the technical customer, which we feel we're more successful that way, because they understand which product, which service better, compared to some other company. If they are more focused on marketing sales, then eventually uh, it's the customer themselves, depend on whether or some depend on third party, uh, can, can really help them to evaluate different product service. I think that, that's where the cybersecurity, there's a lot of hype there, but also you do need some, some, some additional help to helping customers, especially SMB, to identify which product, which service is better. Yeah, and I, I would just agree in saying, I think there's so much that the cybersecurity field can learn by overlaying lessons that have been learned in other fields, like healthcare, um, like climate even. Uh, so when we think about small businesses in the year 2030, I mentioned the idea of security by design. Right now we put a lot of responsibility on small businesses for their own cybersecurity, um, but transferring some of that risk to larger players or people who are developing digital services and products is gonna be a big part of the equation, both for those small businesses as well as the 1.3 billion new users or more that, that um, you, the other questioner had mentioned will be online by 2030. Yeah, that's where the academic side, the government side, and even uh, like sort of insurance side can also help in do some kind of uh, this uh, evaluation judgment um, to, uh, to, to helping the customer. 
great. I would have a question. I, yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Last question. Okay. Many thanks for this super insightful panel. Um, so we listen that artificial intelligence will, of course, help the attackers to increase their attacks. But how do you see uh, the benefits of Gen AI on the side of the companies um, to defend themselves and even maybe opportunity for the small and medium enterprise to get even more hands, so to speak? Uh, this talk we can talk about for hours. <laughs> so we're doing the AI for more than 10 years, but there's a different area uh, related to the security operation side. That's definitely can help in efficiency, quickly respond to the attack. Uh, on the other side, uh, definitely the bad guy also leverage some of that one can increase the attack automation all the things. But also in the cybersecurity, yesterday we talked about uh, we can also help in lower the supporting costs using general AI. Uh, because that's the biggest issue today is cybersecurity cannot go to SMB or consumer because supporting cost is so high. Uh, we have to have engineer behind supporting all these kind of customer. So if AI can handle most of the supporting cost, I believe now security can really go to the SMB, go even go to the consumer, make the whole broad infrastructure more secure. Uh, there's also uh, how to help in on the intelligence side. There's also, there's a lot of things uh, leverage AI right now uh, and machine learning. So we see it's really a risk between the good guy and bad guy. Uh, who, can, <laughs> who can go uh, leverage that first, yeah. Um, well, I'm getting the signal that we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. And please join me in thanking Ken for his insights. <laughs>